Conflict between humans has been a part of human history since, well, since before there has been a history in the form of written records. Humans tend to group together with those similar to themselves. As a result, our earliest communities were homogenous, made up of the same kinds of people, and these communities fought with those different from them. So, fighting with those who are different from us isn't new. However, as states expanded and multiple groups of people came under the same governance, some of the tensions between these groups lessened or even disappeared. There have been some long-standing tensions between groups, for example, between Christians and Muslim communities, like during the Crusades, or between settler groups and native peoples, such as with the Sepoy Rebellion. But a particularly pernicious type of human violence towards entire communities, efforts of ethnic cleansing, which is the expulsion of or killing of members of an unwanted ethnic or religious group, and worse, of genocide, which is the deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially from a particular ethnic or religious identity, have been a constant story in the 20th and early 21st centuries. While not a new phenomenon, after all, just think of how the United States government persistently targeted various Native American groups living in North America, still, the extent of ethnic cleansing and genocide in the recent past are noticeable. What follows then in today's lesson, which is on ethnic cleansing, is a brief overview of some of these events in the recent past. One of the human communities that is most targeted for ethnic cleansing or genocide tend to be the stateless. In a diplomatic sense, to be considered stateless means that one does not qualify for citizenship in the country in which they were born, and they also don't qualify in the countries in which their parents may hold citizenship. Well, this seems like an odd situation for native-born Americans, where we know that just being born in the United States guarantees us American citizenship. That's thanks to the 14th Amendment. However, most countries around the world do not grant citizenship in this way. And as a result, sometimes children are born stateless. For our purposes today, though, we're taking a broader look at this issue of statelessness. And we're going to consider communities of people who, in the aftermath of decolonization especially, were left without their own state, so they were stateless. For many of these stateless peoples, their struggle for recognition stretches for centuries or even millennia, and yet, as the world began acquiring its modern political borders, they were still left out of the equation. A modern example of such stateless people are the Kurds, who originate in the northern Middle East. Linguistically and culturally similar to people of Iranian descent, those known as the Kurds have been identified in the historical record since at least the 4th century CE. And yet, over the course of history, the Kurds were never a large enough proportion of the Middle Eastern population to maintain their own state. During the 9th and 10th centuries, many Kurds converted to Islam, as did most Middle Eastern peoples who lived under Islamic rule. And there were, at times, recognized Kurdish provinces throughout various Muslim states. Beginning in the 16th century, most of the Kurdish population was brought under Ottoman control, and they remained there until the breakup of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. Now at this time, just as was happening elsewhere in the Middle East, Kurdish nationalism rose, and the Kurds attempted to establish autonomous states both within the brand new Republic of Turkey and within the Kingdom of Iraq in the 1920s. But both times, those states were dissolved. In Turkey, the government tried to minimize Kurdish influence by encouraging people of other ethnicities to settle in traditionally Kurdish areas. Or well, in response, the Kurds tried to form their own political party, which was called the PKK, or the Kurdistan Workers' Party. This was their flag. Notice anything about it? Yeah, the PKK was a socialist party, and during the Cold War, that made it hard for the West to support them, even if Western states sympathized with the fact that these Kurds were stateless. Although the PKK sometimes used violence to achieve their aims, and for this reason, they were, and continue to be, labeled a terrorist organization by Turkey and by many international organizations, including NATO, the EU, and the UN. And yes, even the United States considers the PKK a terrorist group. In Iraq, which originally was a monarchy but then became a republic, the Kurds were offered some areas for self-rule, but these areas were not necessarily traditionally Kurdish. Iran wanted to keep some of these traditionally Kurdish areas because they had oil. And while the Kurds accounted for about 17% of Iraq's total population, they were routinely shut out of the political system. 
During the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s, the Kurds started a separate civil war in Iraq, which was, as you might imagine, supported by Iran. In response, the Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein began a program of ethnic cleansing of the Kurds in 1986 that continued until about 1988. Estimates indicate that nearly 200,000 Kurds were killed during this time. One particularly brutal attack against the town of Halabja occurred in 1988 when poison gas was dropped over the town and about 5,000 Kurds were killed. Uh, to this day, a guard of paramilitary look over the mass graves from this particular event. Now, the Kurds were targeted mostly because of their different ethnicity. Most Kurds are Sunni Muslim, as are most Iraqis and most Turks, so there was no need to target them for religious reasons. That said, some of the worst instances of violence against whole communities have come about because of a difference in religion. Probably the most famous attack on a group some called stateless was against the European Jewish community during the late 1930s and early 1940s. The genocide against the Jews and other undesirable populations as described by the Nazi regime is known as the Holocaust. Unlike the Kurds, the Jews did at one time have an independent state, although the Kingdom of Israel had been dead since the time of the Roman Empire. And by the 20th century, European Jews had long since considered themselves citizens of their respective European countries in which they lived and did, in fact, hold citizenship and legal rights in those countries. While the Nazi government of Germany revoked Jewish citizenship in 1935 and began to imprison the Jewish population under its control, eventually moving to exterminate this population beginning in 1941. This plan for extermination of Europe's Jews, called the Final Solution, was only halted in 1945 when the Nazis were defeated by Allied forces. Between 11 and 12 million people total were victims of the Holocaust, of which about 6 million were European Jews. It was the Holocaust which led the new United Nations to adopt the Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. The Holocaust is recognized as genocide of the Jewish people because the Nazi regime attempted to exterminate as many of Europe's Jews as possible. While the promise to create a Jewish homeland had been made before the Holocaust occurred, the victimization of Europe's Jews certainly paved the way for the UN to support the actual creation of a Jewish state and, in 1948, the State of Israel was established. Historically, the Holocaust is perhaps all the more jarring because it wasn't the first genocide in Europe. In 1915, at the beginning of World War I, the Ottoman government began targeting its Armenian population. Unlike the Kurds or the Jews, the Armenians had once maintained a long-standing and powerful state. First established around 600 BCE, the Kingdom of Armenia had maintained its autonomy and, in 301 CE, became the first state ever to adopt Christianity as its religion. While the kingdom was defeated in the 5th century, subsequent rulers in that area, the Byzantine Empire, for example, and the various Arabic states, allowed the Armenians to maintain an autonomous province within their empires. However, by the 15th century, the Armenians had mostly come under Ottoman control. While the early Ottoman sultans valued the varied ethnicities and religious minorities within their empire and allowed them to practice their own traditions so long as they paid a tax to the state, by the late 19th century, these policies had been reversed, and minorities such as the Armenians were very much treated as second-class citizens, or, as one British traveler remarked in 1890, as dogs and pigs. In the late 19th century, the Armenians tried to assert themselves by starting a liberation movement, but this was met with repression by the Ottoman government, and between 200,000 and 300,000 Armenians were massacred between 1895 and 1900. During World War I, the Ottoman Empire supported the Central Powers, so Germany, Austria, and Italy. And, like other states at this time, they used the draft to ensure they had enough soldiers. But this draft was also a way for the Ottoman government to begin the planned extermination of their Armenian population. Men would report for the draft and be massacred instead of being trained as soldiers. As it happened with the later Holocaust, the government also started arresting and imprisoning community elites, journalists, lawyers, and doctors, who might have had ways to counteract or at least publicize this movement. Next, using the pretext that the Armenians were a threat to the government because of their rioting, 
Armenian civilians were rounded up and deported. These deportations often ended in one of two ways, the massacre of those being deported or the death of those marching due to a lack of supplies. For those who survived deportation, most found themselves in various concentration camps along the modern-day Turkish border with Syria and Iraq. Well, this movement of Armenian peoples was witnessed by Europeans in the Ottoman Empire. German engineers, who were in the empire to help their allies build railroads and thus contribute to the war effort, recorded how they saw Armenians loaded onto rail cars like cattle. In 1918, Major General Otto von Losso, head of the German paramilitary in the Ottoman Empire, remarked that, quote, there hardly can be any doubt that the Turks systematically are aiming at the extermination of the few hundred thousand Armenians whom they left alive until now, end quote. News of the Armenian massacres reached an international audience. There were efforts in Europe and in the United States to raise money to stop this extermination. However, it was not until after the war ended that the Ottoman government halted the genocide. The 1920 treaty, which officially ended the war between the Ottoman Empire and the Allies, explicitly called for the Ottoman government to look for and punish those responsible for the genocide. Eventually, a few senior officials in the Ottoman government were tried for their roles in this event. Most historians today believe that upwards of 500,000 Armenians lost their lives between 1914 and about 1923. While much of the world agrees that this event qualifies as a genocide, or at the very least as ethnic cleansing, the Turkish government has never admitted it as such. As for the Armenian territory, after the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, the new Soviet Union claimed it as theirs, and so it was part of the USSR until 1991, when the Republic of Armenia declared independence from the Soviet Union. Sadly, instances of ethnic cleansing have continued to occur in Europe. In the 1990s, tensions in the Balkans led to the Bosnian crisis. And during the Cold War, this entire area was united as one state, Yugoslavia, which, although communist, had been open to diplomacy with the West. In the 1980s, Yugoslavia broke apart into various states, and broke apart along ethnic and religious lines. The majority of the population, Serbs who were also Orthodox Christians, tried to maintain the most territory, and so they targeted Bosnian and Kosovar Muslims in the 1990s. This time, the West, through NATO, intervened, but not before several massacres and atrocities, such as the use of rape to intimidate the population, had occurred. And as you've already learned when we looked at decolonization in Africa, genocide engulfed the country of Rwanda in the mid-1990s. Now here, it wasn't so much about religion as it was about long-standing ethnic tensions and European interventionism. When the Europeans arrived in Central Africa, they found a variety of states in this area, and among them was a strong Tutsi kingdom that had an enormous influence over other Tutsi and Hutu states. When first the Germans and then the Belgians took over, they essentially administered to their colony through the Tutsi, who were the most politically powerful group, but were not the ethnic majority. As independence neared in the early 1960s, Hutus began asserting their power, and as a result, many Tutsis left Rwanda rather than remain and be oppressed. However, some of these refugees eventually formed an army, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, and they invaded Rwanda, sparking a civil war in the 1980s. Well, by the early 1990s, peace had returned, and a Hutu president was elected. For a time, the violence between the Tutsi and Hutu declined, and it seemed that the crisis was over. But then, the Hutu president of neighboring Burundi was assassinated by a Tutsi, and in early 1994, the Rwandan Hutu president was also assassinated, although later, an investigation would show that he was murdered by Hutu extremists, not Tutsis. As a result, extremist Hutus within the government began a propaganda campaign which planned the extermination of Rwanda's Tutsis and any Hutus who defended them. The government armed the Hutu and so, in April of 1994, the genocide began. It lasted for only a hundred days and yet, within that time, an estimated 500,000 to 1 million Rwandans were killed, as much as 20% of the total population. As the genocide was ongoing, the international community mostly just kept watch. Eventually, the UN sent in a peacekeeping force which helped to end the violence, although not before some foreign soldiers were killed. 
Anticipating a Tutsi retaliation, which never came, hundreds of thousands of Hutus fled Rwanda and entered neighboring countries, sparking a refugee crisis. Gee, does that sound familiar? In 1996, trials began for those who participated in the genocide. These are ongoing to this day. Since 2003, Rwanda has been a more peaceful country, with the government consciously attempting to mediate between both large ethnic groups and still attempting to try to figure out why the genocide happened in the first place. As the world gets smaller, both thanks to transportation and communications technology and due to our increasing population, it's inevitable that communities with different values should butt up against one another and occasionally clash. What's certainly avoidable is those instances of ethnic cleansing and genocide that arise from these clashes, which ultimately arise from ignorance. We know, as a global community, that in order to stop genocide, we must confront ignorance. The problem is, how do we do that?